there. Happy Thursday, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Bold Leaders in Learning. I'm Brandon Busteed, President of University Partners and Global Head of Learn, Work, Innovation at Kaplan. And I'm really excited today to have uh, an awesome conversation about data science with Debbie Barabiches, who is the Chief Data Scientist at Metis. Those of you who don't know Metis, uh, it's largely regarded as uh, the best data science boot camp and training program in the country. Interestingly, it's the only accredited data science boot camp in the United States. And, uh, and Debbie, I know we've got a lot of fun things to talk about. You know, the backdrop of this is that, uh, as you know, the job of data scientist has been the, the number one job in America for the last three years in a row. Universities across the country are starting to launch data analytics and data science programs. Obviously, companies of all shapes and sizes uh, are scrambling to find uh, people who have the skill sets to, to work in uh, highly advanced data sets and data sets across different fields. There's a lot to talk about, but I, I wanna start with your background, right? First of all, how does one become a chief data scientist, right? And specifically, how did you get to this place? Because I know as we were talking in the lead up to this, there was a, there was a little bit of a debate as you were in college thinking about philosophy or physics and, I'm just curious. I would love to have you tell us a little bit about your background before we uh, dive into the conversation. Sure. Brandon, thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be in your podcast. Um, so I grew up in Mexico City, and I was part of a community that was fairly conservative. Uh, so they were, you know, people were discouraging me from pursuing a career in STEM, basically in physics or math, because I was a girl. And I've learned since then that that's not so atypical in other parts of the world. But basically, I was told that uh, it's great that you're good in school, that you're good in math, but when it comes time to pick a college, uh, a degree for, for college, you better pick something more feminine, uh, like communications or marketing. And so with time, I learned to hide my love for physics. And so I would read obscure books in the library of physicists, but not really the, the mathematics, but just their stories. I recall one of my childhood heroes was Tycho Brahe, a 16th century Danish astronomer who lived, you know, almost locked up in an observatory in a Danish island that the king gave him. And he was a meticulous obser observer of the sky. In fact, Thanks to him, Kepler got all the data to basically derive the laws of planetary motion. And he was not well liked, this Tico Brahe. He lost his nose in a duel, uh, allegedly, and the king expelled him from the island. So I thought to myself, you know, maybe I'll be like him. I'll be antisocial and <laughs> reckless, like far from, from society, but at least I'll have my observations with me. I'll have science with me. And that was my inner voice, like really uh, strong. I, I had a very loving family, but, you know, with good intentions, my mother was scared. And she said, don't tell boys that you like math and physics, not really knowing uh, what exactly it meant. But she said, you know, you may not be able to get married because they'll get intimidated, which almost happened. Uh, and so uh, with time, I learned to hide that passion and I became insecure about my abilities to do math and physics. So I picked a career in college that my counselors in high school told me was similar to physics. And this was philosophy in the humanities, absolutely no mathematics. And yes, I was so inquisitive and curious about the world and why things happen the way they do that I enjoyed philosophy enormously. But two years in, I decided that my hunger to do physics and to know about the universe and you know how the world works was not going to go away. So behind everyone's back, I applied to be a transfer student at American universities. And I knew that it was a dream that was almost impossible because my parents couldn't have possibly paid uh, what it cost to study in the US, which was eight times what we were paying in Mexico City for a private uh, university in philosophy. 
in the middle of the process, I got a letter from Brandeis University, an amazing school in Massachusetts that said to me, you know, you have very good grades, your essays are full of passion and would like to know more about you. If you take these extra tests, um, you know, the advanced tests in math and physics and you write an essay, we'll consider you for a scholarship that we give to two international students per year. I was extremely fortunate to win a full scholarship, which made my dream come true. So in the middle of the winter, after two years of philosophy in Mexico, I flew without ever seeing the snow. I flew to Boston, I arrived at Brandeis, and I have the courage to venture into an astronomy class. And this was a very generic astronomy 101 class. It had 100 students. I was very shy, but I saw that other women and, and were there in the class, so I, I turned a little bit more confident. And I was in the very back of the class. And the teaching assistant was a graduate student in physics by the name of Rupesh. He came from India. And Rupesh and I became friends. And he told me that I was not the typical student that just wanted to get an A in the class and you know, do the homework well. I was, my curiosity was infinite. And we would walk around campus and I would ask him about quantum mechanics and thermodynamics and you know, well beyond uh, planetary motion and all these things. And one day we were walking in Harvard Square and we sat under a tree and I had tears in my eyes because this whole inner voice just needed to come out. And I told Rupesh, I just don't want to die without trying. I don't want to die without trying to do physics. I'll probably fail because I'm, I don't even remember the basics of algebra, like A plus B, all that squared. I don't, I'm rusty even on that, but I really want to try. He got up went to a payphone, we didn't have cell phones at the time, <laughs> called his advisor and he said, I have a crazy, no, he didn't say that. He said, I have a student right here who would love to add the physics major, but she has only two more years because she's a transfer student and the BA in physics normally takes four years. Yep. The head of the department called me and after a meeting handed me a book, which was an alien language to me. The book was called Div grad and curl and it was vector calculus in three dimensions he said to me ed witten the father of string theory who i knew uh, who he was but of course i thought they were pulling my leg comparing me to ed witten he said ed witten did this before you many years ago he switched from history to physics so we know what to do with it if you study and learn all this book and you'll take a test at the end of the summer we'll let you skip through the first two years of the physics major so that you can complete the whole BA in only two years. Rupesh made my dreams come true because in that moment he decided that he was going to tutor me and mentor me the whole summer. So every day for two months, Rupesh uh, taught me for maybe eight to 10 hours a day. He sat with me and we did calculus on the weekend. Like, we literally didn't have time, but like Saturday derivatives, Sunday integrals, Monday, first three chapters of classical mechanics, you name it. At the end of the summer, Rupesh kind of brought me, you're on your own, and I passed the exam. And I entered my first formal class in physics, I remember was an electronics lab where I was burning too many capacitors. And, uh, but I, I, I try to to survive. And the reason why I tell the story of Rupesh, Brandon, is because it's a very special and unique uh, story that changed my life. And yeah. it's a story about mentorship and the importance of finding people who believe in us. Uh, Rupesh was the first person who believed in me. And I always wanted to pay him for all his mentoring, his dedication, for tutoring me. And he said to me that when he was growing up in Darjeeling, in this small town at the T, in India, there was an old man who used to climb up to his small town and te teach him and his sisters the tabla, the musical instrument, English yeah. and mathematics. And wow. Rupesh's family always wanted to compensate this old man. And he said to them, no, the only way you could ever pay me back is if you do this with someone else in the world. And that's, that's pretty how awesome. 
it's amazing. And that's how my yeah. mission in life began to encourage and inspire other minority students, like women, especially who like myself feel attracted to science, but who for some reason feel that they cannot achieve their dreams. I'm so, I'm, you know, thank you, Debbie, for sharing that. I'm, first of all, I didn't know those parts. I knew the, the high level of like, you know, your debate about, you know, philosophy versus physics, but, um, you know, there's so much you said in there that resonates. A lot of the studies I was involved with in my time at, at Gallup, one was a, one we did with Google, and the big findings of it were that, uh, and this is, you know, gonna, gonna obviously resonate with your story, was that um, young girls versus boys by middle school are essentially stereotyped or cast type, right? Like, oh, boys are good at math and girls are not, or whatever it is. And then it's the same thing for uh, for, for for students who are minorities, right? Where, you know, oh, I don't see, you know, people who look like me who are in these kinds of fields, and in, in particular, the STEM fields, right? Or computer science or data science. And so, you know, the findings were, were really powerful that like these decisions, these influences in a negative way hit students when they're in middle school, right? And so our ability to build diverse talent pipelines starts with changes that we need to make with those signals and those stereotypes that are you know, breaking down uh, uh, opportunities at the middle school level. And then you, know, you talk about mentoring. Um, you know, one of the big studies we did found that that's literally probably uh, the single most important ingredient of college, right? Those who had a mentor during college who encouraged their goals and dreams, right? Like he sat there, listened to a goal and a dream you had and went and made a phone call and did something to make it happen. You know, those, those students who had a mentoring relationship are twice as likely to thrive in their well-being throughout their lives or twice as likely to be engaged in their work. So I, I just, I thank you for that story. And by the way, the other thing that's in that story that, that, uh, that I, I resonate with a lot is that were it not for a full scholarship to a place called Brandeis University, we wouldn't have the benefit of your amazing talent. And so that, um, you know, there's just a lot there that I uh, am grateful for. And I hope that all of us fight to protect, uh, you know, th those opportunities for the best talent from around the world to come to our universities. And then we also do a better job of making sure that we don't send signals, even as parents, let alone teachers, that, you know, our daughters can't be data scientists and physicists. And so, um, in any event, that's uh, that, that that's really a powerful opening. I wanted to start. You know, some some people on this uh, session today probably have a good idea what data science is, but we hear a lot of terms out there, right? We hear about data analytics, we hear about data science, we hear about data literacy, right? So, just give me the breakdown. Like, what's the difference between data literacy versus, say, you know, uh, data analytics, data science, and then somebody who's actually in a role that we would call a data scientist, right? So just break that down a little bit so we're all in the same place of understanding. Sure, I'm glad you asked that question because data science has been around for quite a while, uh, you know, maybe 20 some years now. And I think that still companies and data scientists are still struggling to define what the differences are from AI, machine learning, data science, data analysis, etc. cetera, right? Yeah. And so I would say, Data is everywhere and everybody's talking about data. And when you ask people what data can do, you know, they, they think about, uh, okay, it can predict trends. What, what color is gonna be the new fashion? What um, a political um, a candidate is going to win an election, etc. cetera. Uh, however, there, very few people that consume data in an everyday life actually think of the data behind the products they use. So there's one thing called digital literacy, which is very different from data literacy. Digital literacy means we use Google Maps and there's so much data, we seldom have to think about, you know, Google constantly sending, a, you know, location information from our phones to create those maps, ways telling us how to avoid traffic jams and whatnot. It's a cons it's a data product that we are able to use, but we seldom have to think of it as a data and, and you know, heavy that involves heavy machine learning uh, behind a, a, behind the app. Yeah. And so, data literacy for me is to actually uh, be aware of the fact that uh, data exists 
to uh, use critical thinking to question what the sources of the data are. Are we capturing it accurately? Uh, are we using it ethically? Are we anonymizing it? Are we protecting it? Sort of yeah. knowing more about what we're working with, being able to consume the data, analyze it for predictive purposes, and then uh, being able to communicate what uh, the insights of analyzing that data are. So I would say that um, there are like diff there are different levels of uh, development. So data analysis is kind of the lowest level in that we realize and what people used to call big data, that was sort of the sexiest term right. a few years ago, was just learning the engineering that was so complex and how to set up massive data sets so that we could count events, count things. Like how many people apply uh, for a bank loan? How many uh, events uh, are captured by the large hydro collider in terms of collisions of uh, of uh, subatomic particles and so on. Data analysis was counting the, all those things, but in clever ways. Whereas data science starts uh, you know, at counting those things, but making predictions out of those things. And machine learning is knowing that there are feedback loops, that getting more data uh, coming in spits out better and better insights because it trains the algorithm better. So I don't see these terms as different, but more of a, a, an increasing depth in each one of these layers. Yeah, that, that's a helpful explanation. I mean, even, even for someone like me who spent a little bit more time in the world uh, working with a lot of people who have been you know, involved in data analysis and, and in more of the kind of advanced uh, you know, data science and you know, machine learning driven analysis as well. You know, I, I think it's it's interesting. You know, this goes back to um, you know the 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 interesting conversation about your background, right? You know, there's uh, actually a question that relates to this from Scott Cathcart, who's on uh, right now. He says, "I have a 14 year old daughter going into her freshman year of high school. She loves STEM, trying to figure out her path. What advice would you give her in terms of fields to explore?" And before I have you answer that, right, the uh, where, where I was going with this is that there's a real powerful story here about where the liberal arts and technical skills with data and data tools really uh, are, are a powerful combination. And I point that out because of course, in higher ed, we continue to have this silly conversation about the liberal arts or you know, specific skill training. And when we think about a field like data science, right? Like it, it, it involves technical skill and know-how and tools, but really, the thinking, you know, you use the, the, the thing, your insatiable curiosity, right? Like that's what's driven you. Great data scientists ha have to have insatiable curiosity. What questions can I ask this data? What kinds of, you know, analysis can I, can I perform, right? What other things am I missing? And my point about it is that to do it well, I, I, I presume it, it requires an understanding of a lot of things. Like you have to be a multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary thinker so going back to this question about how to advise, you know, a 14 year old daughter who has interest in STEM in terms of what, what field she explore, like what, what else would you say about that? Yeah, I think I'm gonna answer your, your question on everything you said in a cohesive way, which is using the example that Carol Dweck uh, wrote about in her book, Mindset. Uh, she's a psychologist at Stanford and she basically compared the, the studying styles and the, the uh, bravery that people have when it comes to choosing career paths from boys to girls. And she said that at a very early age, the majority of girls are educated to have a fixed mindset, which means that they are born with a fixed amount of intelligence and that intelligence cannot grow and stretch and that, you know, girls uh, should try to uh, stay doing activities and taking classes where they're already good at and they already showed their skills. Uh, and so do not try uh, new things because you may get a bad grade and that would reflect bad on you. Yeah. Whereas boys are typically uh, educated with a growth mindset. That is, they are taught to be brave and take classes out of curiosity, even if they're not good at them to begin with, to learn the skills. So they're encouraged to fail. And the reason why this is so important is because science itself and data science are full of failure. 
failure is so important. Like my friend Reshma Sajani wrote in her book for girls, brave, not perfect, right? Educate girls to be brave, to take that class where they're not good at. Uh, after uh, my, getting my BA at Brandeis, I ended up uh, being accepted to Stanford with a Nobel Prize winner. And I was all happy, but it was extremely challenging because I didn't have the background that all these other people had. And I had to uh, sort of believe in myself in a way twice as much as the people who had already uh, known that they had those skills. But if you persevere hard enough and you have that mindset that you can grow any skill and you can learn anything, I think that helps uh, girls enormously. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, there's, I, I've, I've read a number of books. I'm a father of a almost 11 year old daughter, right? And I think about it from my, my parenting side of things, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of literature out there about how important it is for dads in particular, for example, to help build the confidence of their daughters. And, you know, there's a lot of do's and don'ts underneath that, you know, general advice that, you know, I encourage people to read more about as I'm still trying to read more about, but this idea of growth mindset is really important, right? And, and you also said something I think is like probably, uh, you know, a really important thing for, for young people to hear. Data science is full of failure, right? Like failure actually leads you to different routes and answers and ultimate success. And so like, you know, to embrace failure as something that's like a positive, we're not, you know, we're, we're not a society that, you know, generally positions failure as a positive. And so uh, I just think those are really, really good, you know, general pieces of advice, right? And so that, you know, that growth mindset framework, the, you know, the thinking about how do you, how do you build confidence, right? And confidence can come through that didn't work. And I need to go back and try a different route. So um, one of my uh, former colleagues, uh, who was, uh, he, he's now uh, passed away, unfortunately, but uh, was the world's expert on hope, um, as in, you know, hope, right? H-O-P-E, hope. And he always said that the components of measuring hope were about uh, having a goal, right? So you have a goal. Most people have a goal. Uh, they uh, see uh, multiple ways to accomplish that goal, so pathways. And then the final component of it was self-efficacy, their belief in their ability to make it so. What I thought was fascinating about his research is usually people aren't low on having a goal if they are low on hope. And they're not low on self-efficacy. They're low on pathways. That is, they're like, oh, there's only one route to success. And if I don't succeed down that path, there's no other route. So anyway, you made me think about that as well. You know, the more pathways we can create uh, for, for students to realize there's a number of different ways they can succeed if they don't get to their goal in the first place is important. I want to segue a little bit into, uh, you know, the, the demand for data science in this world. Uh, it's across every industry, every organization, business, nonprofit, government entity. Uh, we're seeing it uh, alive and well in all the epidemiological models right now and the predictions of COVID spread. And so, uh, so it's been a, a marvelous showcase of what, uh, what data science can do in different fields. Um, how, how do we get more people trained in data science? I mean, right, right now, we just can't get enough people trained adequately. So what are some of the levers to do that? I mean, where, where do you see us ramping up uh, the capability of training people in data science? Yeah, I think there are three important factors for data literacy, especially in a business context, and they're data, tools, and techniques. So there are a lot of companies that have tons of data about how they've been running business for quite a while, but they don't have the techniques, meaning the expertise in-house because they hire data scientists uh, with the hope that they would solve those problems, but those data scientists were perhaps experts in some other field that can be confusing. Sometimes they don't have the right tools, like um, not you know every large company can do with open source. You may have auditing and, and some more sophisticated uh, things that where you need proprietary tools, and you know you can have any combination of these three things. Uh, so data literacy starts by aligning these three data, tools, and techniques. Uh, I would say you have to segment the population and the, the, uh, the base uh, of employers, uh, if you're a company, in order to become data literate. It all starts with data awareness. 
uh, it's funny how many people say, oh, I don't work with data because all I have is an Excel spreadsheet, but I'm never calculating anything. I just have it because it, it's a snapshot of, you know, of what I'm doing today. But, you know, everything is data. If you watch a video on YouTube, that's data because, you know, when it was uh, created, how many minutes it lasts, you can even mine the video with NLP, natural language processing, to extract the words and have information. So everything around us is, is data. But a retail person or say a janitor in an airport is going to consume data very differently than an R&D expert that's using deep learning. Maybe the janitor, you know, we're all familiar in the airport restrooms when you press those smiley faces or the frowny faces, yeah. send the signal about how the bathroom uh, is, is like at that moment. And the janitor, instead of manually scheduling the hours in which he or she goes to check, now they get a message in their watch uh, that says, you know, there are a lot of frowny faces, go and check what's going on. So that person is not going to know about which model, which assumptions are being taken, and they don't need to, right? But then perhaps, uh, you know, medium uh, level management needs to know they're gonna be the client and the consumer of uh, more of the data. So they need to know, without knowing the technicalities, a little bit about the logic uh, behind the model, uh, what are the assumptions and, and, you know, what insights do I need to make decisions? Like if I'm selling products for a company and we are out of this one product, what is the data telling me that is the best substitute for that product so I can put it in front of the client and so on until we have, we come to the last layer, which is always keeping the experts cutting edge and they are the ones that need to know what trends are out there what new tools and technologies exist to solve the problems and what i always say is that to scale this you need to let people help themselves so basically create office hours for like a data office uh, where people go and they create uh, lunch and learns and and they they answer any data question and so that data and data insights are flowing in the very everyday operations of a company. Right. Forrester did a research and I think they, they realized that less than 50% of decisions in corporate uh, in corporations in the US are made based on quantitative data. And most of them are based on yeah. intuition, past experiences, yeah. gut. So, you know, that's... Uh, there's right. a lot to be said for that. I think we're getting to a place where some things have become so important and ubiquitous, right, that everybody needs to have a level of awareness and understanding. So I, I certainly think data, you know, data awareness is that is in that category where all layers of the organization need to have some understanding of that. I think things like, you know, cybersecurity, right? It's become like, I don't need to be an expert in cybersecurity, but I ought to understand where an organization has critical weaknesses and you know potential threats and of course a lot of those are about human behaviors you know do i leave confidential information out in the open and you know all that kind of stuff so um it, 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 talking about universities right as universities think about how they stay relevant in terms of what they teach for students right we know there's huge demands for data science obviously a lot of universities trying to launch degree programs around this. Okay. And I think that's a, that's a, you know, a fantastic effort. But one of the things I keep thinking about is that, um, you know, a student who has the interest and aptitude can get pretty deep in their understanding of data science and its tools and techniques in a matter of, I mean, I, I know that the, the, the camps you've designed right there, what are they 14, 16 weeks in length? Um, it, so weeks are because 12. 12 weeks. Okay. So, so 12 weeks, right? So th three months of intensive training. Um, you know, why, if I'm, if I, let's just say I'm a go-getter college student, I'm a freshman at college. Why wouldn't I do a 12 week boot camp in the summer of my freshman year and then, you know, do consulting work for a company where I could get paid a couple hundred dollars an hour, right? Like, am I, am I silly to think that that's, uh, you know, something that college students should think about? And you and I were discussing before we went live about you know, being able to come from various backgrounds. I have students who are humanities majors or English majors and you know, sociology that 
think deeply about human behavior and love data and they become very good data scientists. So I think the training that we do is at all levels. We have a, a data literacy course that teaches everybody skills that I think are essential uh, skills for life. For example, how to not be misled by data graphs, right? You know, you, we've all seen- That's the a good one. Graph. Yeah, we can all use one of those. Yeah, that says, yeah. oh, we've had year over year consistent growth in sales. And of course they, they forgot to label the Y axis, the vertical axis. So when you really put a zero on it, you see that that you know, is only half of a percentage in growth year over year. So pretty much the company has been stagnant, but they're telling you a very different story. If they zoom in to that little area of the top of the graph, right? And, and correlation is not causation, all kinds of things. You know, and now with the pandemic, people are just telling, you know, things and putting graphs out there that are pretty misleading for the public. So educating the public in, in interpreting what graphs mean, what data me means, what assumptions, how to, how to really uh, uh, dig deeper and think critically about the information that we're receiving that's consumed and made pretty by someone else is an essential skill. At the same time, we do trainings for corporations that go all the way to the more sophisticated uh, trends in data science, like uh, how to use NLP and, and how to uh, build recommendation engines that are effective and efficient and how to do uh, good image object recognition with deep learning. So I think at all levels, you can choose what kind of training fits. Uh, but I think at the essential level, a data literacy course is super important these days. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think we're at a point now where data literacy for you know high school students is important, for college students, for really anybody uh, to be you know a sophisticated consumer or even just a basic consumer of information, right? To be able to make decisions, uh, you know that that's really critical. And you know, and I think one of the other big messages that you've you've been clear about is that you know people can come into data science from any kind of field and background, right? So to be intimidated by it, that like, oh, I don't do math or I'm not good with numbers or or whatever, right? Like that's clearly not the right mindset. Certainly not a growth mindset to have in coming into it. But I really do think you know universities, as much as I know they love to build new degree programs, I think they can uh, you know be an incredible asset to launching shorter term non-degree training right either you know the basic data literacy where all students have to take at least a class in that uh or you know think about ways that they can help students get some real competency with data science where not only is that going to help them get a great job when they graduate but they could be working in a job like that on a project basis or a consulting basis while they're in school and making pretty good money so um so anyway, I I am so grateful that uh, that we had you on. I know that your 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 Discovery Channel show is currently not taping, but um, I'm eager to I'm eager to catch more of your episodes coming soon. For those of you who don't know, uh, Debbie's on a show that that has a cool title. It's it, you just give a little plug for your show so that people know to tune in. Sure, it's the number one show on the Science Channel. It's called Outrageous Acts of Science. And we have 11 seasons out. You can watch it on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and YouTube. And of course, talk with us and send us your questions. And it explains the science behind everyday engineering feats. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, thank you for joining us in this show. I've, I've had lots of great folks. I've never had a celebrity before. So now I'm delighted that I've had my first <laughs> celebrity. So uh, thank you, Debbie. Have a thank great you, rest brother. of your week. Yep. And uh, keep up time. the great work. Yeah. <laughs>